Good afternoon, good morning. Thank you everyone for joining me today. I am Céline Penuti and I head the Staples Research at JP Morgan. I am delighted today as part of our CEO Fireside Chat series to be joined by Mark Schneider, CEO of Nestlé. Good afternoon, Mark. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming out to see us. Uh, yeah, thank you for hosting me here uh, in your headquarters in Veve, Switzerland. Mark, um, maybe we'll start with a, a broad question um, on uh, endless volatility that uh, we uh, see in the marketplace and from a macroeconomic standpoint. If I look at the sector and yourself, uh, we have seen in the past quarter the hit from the stocking, the hit from uh, the normalization of uh, consumption post COVID, um, as well as uh, your choice to, to decide to go for SKU, SKU rationalization and maybe some of the MA that didn't work out the way uh, it was expected. So, what I would like to understand is when we look at all of that, how do you make of those? Do you think that we could? see um, those in the rear mirror soon or already now? And um, should uh, we expect Nestle steadiness uh, to come back? Um, that's one of the future that investors are looking at for your company. Sure, completely understand. And look, I think it's a good high level question to get started. And I think there's a few sub uh, questions rolled into that. Yeah. Uh, let me start on volatility. Obviously, the last three years, when you look at um, the combined effects of uh, COVID, the war, uh, inflation spiking, all of these are essentially 50 or 100 year events uh, that were whacking around so many companies. And obviously, the gyrations were so strong that no company, even the most stable ones, uh, was completely exempted from that. We were no exception. I think we have done well under the circumstances. But obviously, if things have been gyrating up and down. Just look at, for example, how real internal growth uh, skyrocketed in 21 and then how pricing has been taken over in 22 and at the beginning of 23. The important thing is that, relatively speaking, compared to the rest of industry and also compared to our sector specifically, I think we've been coping with these circumstances with what I consider to be, in all modesty, quite low volatility when it comes to the underlying stock performance. So when I try to look at hard measures, like, for example, equity better, it used to be in the range of 0.7 to 0.8 in the years before COVID. It has come down to around 0.6. So that's telling you something. Mm -hmm. When I look at how some of our metrics, like organic growth, the components of organic growth, and also our earnings, how they have developed and how the volatility stacked up against uh, some of our industry peers, they're also, um, I mean, while everybody was on somewhat different cycles, Overall, the volatility in our metrics uh, has been below average, while the total growth rates were actually uh, doing quite well. So I think on that one, while no one was able to escape the geopolitics and, um, and decisions that were outside of our control, under the circumstances, Nestle has proven itself one more time as a relatively dependable and stable growth-oriented company. On the acquisition track record, um, here, obviously, there was a lot of attention on the two transactions that we pointed out in our Barcelona Investor Day, uh, freshly in A-Immune. Uh, we were very open uh, about the fact that we did not fully meet our objectives there and to have been continuing that full transparency throughout the, few, uh, the Q4 coverage and Q1 coverage. And I think this is, in my view, textbook ways of handling with things that don't fully meet objectives, rather than trying to sweep it on the carpet or trying to cross it over or switch the topic to something else. I think we laid it out to everyone as openly as possible, even though it's um, uncomfortable, unpleasant news. Let me tell you the fact that these two haven't met objectives is something that personally I take very, very seriously. I hope that was visible as part of Barcelona and the Q4 coverage. And I would also like to point out that we attached, we didn't just bring the bad news. I think we attached a consequence to both of these cases. So in the case of Freshly, with the merger with Cattle Cuisine, there is a pivot strategically to something that looks a lot more promising for the next few years to come, and that is catering to out-of-home environments that want to save on labor costs locally of food preparation. In the case of uh, A. Immune, I think we've been very clear that uh, going forward, the growth strategy of Nestle Health Science is going to be so much more focused on consumer care and medical nutrition that we're not seeking extra new growth uh, and acquisitions in the novel therapeutic area where we had uh, a below par performance. Overall, 
is nonetheless a matter of pride to me that the acquisition track record, since we've done quite a few deals since 2017, has been a very favorable one. There's a number of metrics. Did it contribute to um, growth in earnings? Yes, it did. Did the vast majority of these transactions meet or exceed the business plan? Yes, they did. And did we overall uh, create uh, positive returns? And we shared all these numbers as part of Barcelona. And I think they speak overall, in spite of these two incredible incidences, for a very favorable performance. You mentioned a real internal growth. Um, clearly, uh, this year you are given a guidance of six to eight percent, so organic growth that's ahead uh, of uh, your midterm growth. Um, real internal growth has been negative in the past quarters, but you are alluding to uh, becoming back to positive as we look into the second half. And I think you know some of the uh, points that I mentioned earlier about the OSKU reduction or the cost, uh, sorry, the um, COVID-related normalization have been hit uh, to your performance. Yeah. Um, I think on the, the last one on the normalization, I think you said it will take four to six quarters to wash out. Just would like to understand where are we in that journey? And Maybe in plain words, uh, do we expect rig to be back to two to three percent by 24? And um, I think you know SKU rationalization. There's already been a lot of discussion on that, but just one, if I may, um, could you give us some tangible evidence when you have cut the tails and pushed the heads? Um, what has uh, it brought to the business? Yeah. So um, I think one of the most important disconnects as we talked to investors over the last few quarters was that um, any potential disappointment that they may have seen on volume growth and real internal growth was solely in the discussion attributed to pricing alone, as if that was a 100% push-pull relationship. And as you pointed out in your question, uh, there were actually several um, swing factors here at work. Uh, one was uh, the post-COVID normalization. One was certainly inflation, and that was a big one, no question about it. And then there's a third one, and that is um, the fact that uh, we started this process of portfolio optimization. And as you saw, once we started talking about it, um, that kind of talk was kind of picked up by many other industry peers as well. So I think everyone, in a sense, was um, facing very similar issues. Um, the reason that the post-COVID normalization uh, is more than four quarters has to do with the fact that COVID didn't end everywhere at the same time. So I think four to six is a rough estimate. It could also be seven or whatever. Uh, Time-wise, I believe that starting from the second half of the year, unless we're seeing any other major surprises, but starting from the second half of the year, you could safely say that uh, that period uh, should be out of the way. Then you still have the two others at work. Uh, one is uh, the reaction to inflation and pricing and economic woes and uh, the portfolio uh, rationalization. On the portfolio rationalization, to me, the most tangible uh, um, uh, yardstick and uh, metric is simply that our service levels on the high rotating articles have been increasing a lot. I think we um, pointed that out as part of the Q1 call. And that's exactly the intended logic. So for the ones that are high rotation anyways, to drive their on-shelf availability and really make sure that those uh, are always there when the consumer wants them. Pricing, uh, you alluded, has been uh, very strong. Now, uh, the market is you know, getting uh, quickly looking about the fact that some of the cost, uh, spot commodities cost have come down. It's not just commodities. You've seen uh, well, oil prices, you see gas prices, you see the easing of distribution cost. Um, so there's a lot of debate about whether the industry as a whole will be able to hold on to quite extraordinary pricing that has been put through in developed markets, especially in the past two years, and that as well impact Nestle. Uh, so I know that uh, you're not, you're, you still have quite a lot of costs to go through this year in terms of COGS and hedging as well as an impact, as well as uh, SGNA. But at some point, um, Nestle also will start to see that easing of cost coming into the PNL. So the question is, when we hear politicians, like in France, uh, when we hear retailers talking about uh, looking for uh, having good deal for uh, consumers, uh, how realistic is it that price will be sticky? How do you expect Nestle uh, to, to deal with that normalization of the commodity uh, tailwind? 
Yeah. So obviously, this is a period when you find a lot of comments on this subject from all sorts of corners, <laughs> whether it's retailers, consumer advocates, uh, politicians, as you pointed out. And we understand that affordability, especially for food and beverage, is a very important um, aspect and one that we're committed to. Um, the answer on how these um, uh, gyrations flow um, is very different by category and by geography, so it's very hard to give you one general answer here. But obviously, when you see now an easing uh, when it comes to spot prices, or when you see an easing on products that are sold without much value added, just like raw eggs, for example, then uh, that doesn't mean that for a large value-added strategy manufacturer like us, uh, the situation is the same. As you mentioned, there's forward contracting. Very often, if you had an easing on the spot price now, what people disregard is that there had been a full year of pricing building up before that uh, that we had to uh, stomach. And so then uh, it's always important to look at it on you know pre-inflation levels and how does the current spot price compare to pre-inflation levels and not to the price from three months ago. And so all of that then leads to a true situation uh, by category, by geography, about where we stand. And obviously, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try to stay competitive with our products going forward. But overall, as you know from the consolidated uh, gross margin, uh, we still have catching up to do. And as I look at the P&Ls of so many of our peers, the situation doesn't seem to be very different. So it's important to look through some of the comments and also sometimes self-serving rhetoric uh, and really look at the underlying facts. And then um, just like the spike was kind of recognized late, I think now people cry victory a little too early about maybe just an easing here from uh, top pricing levels. And uh, overall, it's not a bad assumption to assume that underlying inflation rates in many economies during the 2020s uh, will remain at a higher level than uh, going into COVID. Yeah. One area I would like to discuss about is the consumer uh, demand. Um, you mentioned at your Q1 stage that, oh, you got a bit little cautious about the European. So let's start there, the European consumer. And it's true, it has been rather resilient. Uh, we were expecting consumer in Europe to be under much pressure, and it has been up to now rather resilient. So. Um, what, uh, you know, you've been a bit more cautious. How do you think uh, that uh, the consumer in Europe will evolve? What, you know, could be the area of worries, down trading, private label um, uh, competition? And we also noted that uh, some of the data, uh, ma uh, market data that we, we look at, uh, are starting to see effect to show effectively volume uh, being under pressure, though it has not yet shown in your uh, numbers. Um, are we at risk to see the same impact uh, in Europe that we have seen in the US we were just discussing at the end of last year? I think it's important when you look back on the past winter, compared to anything we ever feared uh, last fall, late last mm -hmm. summer, the consumer everywhere has held up so much better. And um, so, yes, I think um, when you listen into some of the Q1 calls, everyone had expressed a certain amount of caution over April. But here again, it's important, especially in a nervous environment, a nervous investor environment, that we keep apart uh, seasonality and the way some of the holidays fall uh, from you know, what is true underlying sentiment. It's unlikely to me that from one month to another, a consumer all of a sudden cuts spending sharply on something that is as much of a daily staple item as food and beverage. And uh, so that's why I think um, it's probably important to read out May and June and with the second quarter and the performance over the summer, get a clearer picture here on, on what happens. Every time I see a strong movement from one month to another, um, it usually doesn't tend to be macroeconomics at work. It's more likely that something else, like the calendar, for example, yeah. and the number of trading days uh, is at work. And so that's why it's important not to overinterpret uh, some of that softness that was discussed uh, during April. Right. Um, maybe another big region is the US. And I think in the past weeks, we heard some of your uh, customers, retailers, um, have been talking about maybe a bit more uh, prudence from a discretionary standpoint for some of the uh, US consumer, though food and beverage had been resilient. Um, now, on the US, your uh, portfolio lends itself to more premium, uh, if I think about pet, coffee, uh, nutrition. Um, could you tell us 
what percentage uh, do you think of your portfolio is premium uh, in the US? And um, going into that, if there were uh, more of a pressure on the consumer going forward in the US or a, uh, a recession, how would, you ex how would you expect some of those uh, categories to behave? Sure. Um, let me comment on how I interpreted some of yeah. these um, uh, statements on the U.S. consumer, then also specifically uh, comment on our U.S. Uh, premium uh, sales share. So uh, it's not a surprise to me that for truly discretionary consumer items, and especially some of the higher priced ones, more durable ones, uh, there's got to be an impact when the economic sentiment uh, worsens. And uh, this may not be the best time to go out and buy a new flat screen TV. Um, so, so, so that I get. But um, when I look at the nature of food and beverage, there's so much more continuity built in. That's, that's the nature of the beast. And even the premium part there, usually, I mean, what we're talking about starts at about 20, 25% of a markup over the average price in the category. So this is not leaps and bounds. This sometimes only boils down to a few cents or a few dollars. And I think you're seeing sufficient numbers of categories in the food and beverage space where even in recession times, that little low-priced everyday luxury actually becomes very, very dear to, to the consumer. That's not something they want to go without when they have to delay other major purchases and maybe not have the vacation plans they had in mind and what have you. So, so that's why it's important not to confuse the two. Now, on premium, as you know, for the group overall, the share of premium products stands at about a third. Uh, it is true that Zone North America over-indexes slightly on that, but not in leaps and bounds. So there the number is around 40%. And um, I think we frequently mentioned that from any readout we have from past economic cycles, usually the premium part in our portfolio and in uh, food and beverage in general tends to hold up really well. So I don't see it as a liability. In fact, I see it more as a strength. Uh, should it be a liability, it's important to know that while the U.S. and so North America slightly over-indexes here on premium products, I think in our most important core categories, we also have a successful lineup of uh, brands at different price points. So it's not that we're totally losing that consumer. And uh, so that's why I think there's some resilience built into the business setup we have, including for North America. Right. Staying on North America, um, one, I think, key uh, uh, success has been the pet, uh, the pet division, the pet food division. Um, I think, you know, the, structurally, the fundamentals are quite good for this division. And you are also, I think, still capacity constrained. Um, but uh, what I would like to understand is uh, how we should think about the normalization after a very strong period of growth uh, going into the next couple of years. I think, you know, on one side, if you could comment on pet adoption, uh, which has been very high, are we seeing now a plateauing level or are you still seeing growth, growth over a very high level? And then on the mixed side, <clears throat> you were uh, just alluding that uh, premium tends to be uh, uh, resilient. When you look at pet uh, and the absolute price point, do you also think that uh, this would be the case for that uh, category? Yeah. So um, on the pet category overall, and when it comes to private pet ownership, we see that even post-COVID, the pet population tends to grow at around 2 to 3%. Uh, so it's not like we're seeing all of a sudden uh, a steep uh, dip here, and mm -hmm. uh, I think that bodes well. And then when you think back to one of the key growth drivers from before the pandemic, and that was um, the rising share of what we call calorific conversion in emerging markets, uh, that also tends to be underway. So it's not like all of a sudden that stopped. So more and more households in uh, emerging markets as their earnings over the years increase, they switch from feeding the pet with uh, household food waste to dedicated pet food, which of course is much more hygienic, uh, has health advantages for the pet, and also gains the household some time and convenience. And um, that catch-up area is still very, very vast. So for each 1% of calorific conversion uh, that we uh, see in emerging markets, that translates into about a billion uh, dollars of market size. So, you know, this trend continues in undiminished fashion. That is why 
I mean, clearly for a quarter or two, or maybe just for the normal lapping, could you see at some point a bit of a normalization here from uh, some of the very, very strong growth we've recently seen? Yes, absolutely. But when it comes to the true underlying trend, um, clearly, um, you know, uh, it, it, it points to continued very successful above par growth when I compare this to a lot of other categories. And that's also why we were so happy to commit the investment here to be sure that we always have the ability to supply because we know that even if we're off by a few months here, sooner or later, we will grow into that new additional capacity. The risk of creating white elephants, which means large plants that run at permanently low capacity utilization, is very low. On the premiumization and you know how recession-proof that is for pet foods, let me answer with a quip, and that is, um, Dogs and cats do not know where we stand in the economic cycle. And if you own a pet, you know that um, their willingness to trade down is very, very limited. And they know how to make you unhappy and, uh, and, and, and share that feeling. And as a dog owner, I can tell you about that from firsthand experience. And so that is why around the world, not just North America, um, when I look at last um, recessions, downturns, whatever, period, uh, periods of hardship, usually uh, that premium part has held up really well. Let me also say one other trend that I think skews very nicely when it comes to our portfolio in particular. Um, over the years, the population in uh, cats has been particularly on a tear, and uh, I think that fits very nicely with our portfolio strength. And then in dogs, uh, small dogs are also uh, kind of yeah. seeing above average growth, and here again, that's a good fit with our portfolio. Yeah, as cat owner, I as well agree on the <laughs> how um, and they can be very uh, fussy uh, with their food. Now, my um, next question would be on um, Nespresso. Um, clearly, um, you know we've seen some weakness, and clearly as well from a tough comparative base. But at the same time, uh, I think you spoke in prior uh, calls about the total single serve portfolio. So, is it that you are seeing a migration uh, from a high end to maybe more mass market, and is that maybe what uh, we should be looking at for the foreseeable uh, future? Uh, now that we um, given the economic condition that we alluded before. Um, and then specifically on Nespresso, if I may, if you could talk about Virtuo um, and Nespresso in the US, the opportunities there and how sizable they have become. Yeah, absolutely. And Nespresso is a good example of what we discussed earlier, and that is uh, overlapping cycles and generations of different nature. So yes, undeniably, for a system that was wonderful for people working from home and you know trying to enjoy a fresh cup of coffee every time you just feel like it without much preparation, um, as people now migrate back, at least for a fraction of their time, to the offices, that normalization was unavoidable. So you're seeing that, and I think, to me, Espresso is a poster child of one of our categories that is now seeing a bit of uh, post-COVID normalization. And where I think as part of the Q1 call, we pointed to the fact that uh, that should start to normalize uh, in the summer and second half of the year. And then there's the second trend at work, um, where undeniably, I mean, we've seen significant inflation. People are looking for cheaper alternatives. Uh, there may also be um, a less optimistic economic outlook. And so people may stay with a capsule system, but then look in retail for some other compatible capsules that they can still run on the same system. And that one we're answering uh, uh, through the rollout uh, of Nescafe Farmers Origins so that we're not losing that consumer. Mm -hmm. So here again, good case in point on what I was trying to tell you earlier that um, we stick with the long-term potential of premium, but obviously having a trustworthy and uh, well-known uh, good brand at the mid-range available is a good way to not lose the consumer entirely. But obviously, other retail uh, brands that offer portion coffee benefit from that trend as well. But long term, um, you know, I think Nespresso has always been able to convince the consumer of the premiumness of its uh, product range, and uh, we have undiminished uh, faith in that. Specifically, when it comes to their tool, I mean, the US rollout has been a super uh, success story. Um, we still have a fairly low penetration. We estimate that penetration to be in the single digit percent range. And so that also means that, uh, you know, in addition to that wonderful past performance, 
I think you have a very nice runway uh, ahead of yourself for the virtual system in the US. Um, one deal that effectively created a lot of value and you presented at the CMD last year is been the Starbucks deal. Um, now, I wanted to, you know, like uh, the deal was uh, done like a few years ago and then in 2021, uh, you signed on for the ready to drink um, uh, development in Latin and Asia and you acquired the Seattle Best Coffee as well. Just wanted to know, you know, where we are in terms of how this uh, franchise evolves and if you could specifically also talk about the out of home opportunity for the Star Starbucks brand. Sure. Um, so... I think the best high-level description was given by David Rennie in his Barcelona presentation at the end of November last year, where he characterized that first phase from the beginning of 2019 to the year 2022 as the one where Crove was extensively fueled by the global rollout. And just basically getting to markets where Starbucks retail was not available before. And um, that clearly was a major contributing factor in addition to, uh, for example, COVID driving in-home consumption and so forth. And that we were now segueing to the next phase of growth. And uh, that phase is a lot more driven by uh, pipeline innovation. And obviously, you know, our joint work with Starbucks here on capturing all these opportunities from seasonal uh, to uh, additional whiteness and, uh, and so forth. I think that uh, is pivotal uh, to drive that growth going forward and making it resilient and independent of the geographical rollout. And uh, so we have faith in that and we're quite impressed. And I think we underline that frequently that uh, we, we're seeing a very, very strong uh, pipeline here going forward. It also involves digital. So any ways here to build more of an ecosystem, uh, I think, is another way to make that um, Starbucks opportunity uh, stick and, uh, and grow for the long term. Out of home, um, obviously, um, the easiest way for a hotel to signal, um, whether it's on the room or in some public areas or meeting areas, that they really care about serving high quality coffee is to serve up a recognizable brand name. And yes, uh, there is very few brand names in the coffee industry that are more recognizable than Starbucks. And as we're seeing now, the number of meetings um, um, increase again and out of home stays and business travel. I think this is exactly the kind of price point uh, that uh, Starbucks and Starbucks-like hospitality places are well positioned for. Moving on to uh, Nestle Health Science, uh, you did a CMD, a lot of presentation on that, so we're not going to dwell on it too much uh, now. I just wanted to, and I think you recently said that uh, there's no reason why the profitability should not bounce back post immune so that's uh, great news. Um, now, on, um, I wanted to understand uh, from uh, how you built that business. Um, you said that you would concentrate uh, on the consumer and the medical uh, portion, and you have ambition to really build this as a pillar for Nestle. Um, but at the same time, you are integrating Bountiful. So are we right now at a level where you are uh, looking at integration rather than further acquisition, or whether could that business be built further um, on yeah, different parts of it? Yeah, so um, clearly, I would like to confirm that confidence that we can get to that 18% uh, uh, yeah. margin level that we outlined earlier. And it is not just a immune. It's also about making that consolidation successful in the U.S. Because one of the rationales, um, in addition to the wonderful brand names, for buying uh, uh, the Bountiful Company was this very strong supply chain backbone that was um, promising us lots of um, industrial synergies. And so this is not a given. This is something we have to do and that we have to implement and execute in very successful ways. And that is certainly a priority right now. And so uh, this is not the period where you put all your energy into deal hunting then uh, for the two segments that we want to grow going forward. And that is the consumer care side and the medical nutrition side. Now, having said that, in business, it's rarely completely black or white. Uh, it's more like shades of gray. And so if something really tempting and something that is a great fit came along, obviously we would be open-minded. But um, at the moment, you're right, the bias is more towards a picture-perfect integration, mm -hmm. reaping all these synergies according to business plans, and um, then really making sure that we're well-positioned for that profitable growth going forward. 
that to me is no contradiction to um, a very ambitious uh, plan going forward in terms of growing this business. Um, and again, if something tantalizing short term does come up where we kind of feel it would be sad to let it go, you know, it won't come back in the future, then yeah, we'll be ready for this and we'll find the energy somehow to make it happen. Hmm. Moving from health to healthy foods, um, some investors have asked Nestle to set a target to increase uh, the percentage of healthy foods in your portfolio. Can you share uh, your views on that? Um, I think I heard you in the past talking about um, the importance to bring indulgence with confectionery or convenience in uh, prepared food or frozen food. So can you try to help us understand how we can reconcile uh, those uh, with your stated ambition to uh, bring healthy foods to consumer? Absolutely, and I appreciate the opportunity to lay out our <laughs> thinking on this uh, because I still see that in the public debate uh, there's quite a bit of uh, misunderstanding about that. And um, to me, um, the starting point is that we have given you now with a sustainability report for the year 22 com as the first company, to my knowledge, you know, among the large food and beverage players, complete global transparency across the health style rating and the full global portfolio. So no longer just pointing to individual country markets um, and then you know highlighting the portfolio composition there, but rather you have now the complete visibility across the global portfolio on a rating system that is globally recognized and is also used, for example, by Access to Nutrition Index, ATNI. And um, so I think this is one that carries a lot of credibility. And so that transparency we're very much committed to and uh, I hope it gets appreciated by our investors just as much as by the public. Now having said that, we will also lay out a target for where we intend to take the healthy products over time and that'll come later this year, but it'll be a target that'll talk about how this grows. It will not be a target that talks about the proportion of healthy versus uh, product uh, ranges that are rated at three and a half or less on this health star mm -hmm. rating range. And um, the reason is that um, one should not see one at the expense of another. As we look at the reality of what we eat every day, uh, clearly just relegating yourself to something that is higher than three and a half is not mirroring the reality of how people eat. And we want to be a complete food and beverage company, one that covers the healthy aspects just as much as the enjoyable aspects that may have a lower rating. And uh, we have a different thought pattern for that part that gets uh, rated lower. And that is here, we should make more efforts over time to encourage what we call responsible consumption. And that comes, for example, with the leading, one of the leading um, marketing nutrition policies that we issued uh, last year that will come into effect July 1st. Uh, we will over time become more active and Sort of roll out new commitments when it comes to portion guidance and full transparency on what's uh, uh, in those um, uh, packages. So here, I think, uh, we're trying to fill with life this whole notion of putting educated consumers in a position to make educated decisions about what they're taking, how much of it should be taken, how that compares to recommended uh, maximum levels. The healthy part has been growing, even without a commitment, a lot more over the past few years, uh, we don't foresee that to slow down. Okay, so automatically, I mean, we've been on a path already where that uh, part is growing more over time. And hence, yes, I think it does make sense to articulate some sort of uh, target size down the road, but it should not be articulated in ways where you kind of give uh, the lower rated parts of the portfolio a second fiddle. Uh, because mm -hmm. clearly people eat for enjoyment just as much as they eat uh, for uh, nutrition and health aspects. Yeah. In fact, that brings me to my next question. Is confectionery is not uh, one of the categories we talk a lot about? But if I look around um, at Nestle, but your competitors as well, we've seen that the growth for confectionery snacking has been quite elevated. It as well as translated into uh, good returns for shareholders uh, in this category, value creation. So I just wanted to get your thought on how you, you feel about that. Um, 
I would have thought, I mean, KitKat obviously is uh, the flagship and very successful brand. Uh, the portfolio then is quite fragmented. I was wondering whether there would be more of a, a need to cut down some of those local brands or would m and be part of uh, the journey there? Yeah. So very important question and maybe also a way to point out some of the structural differences uh, in our portfolio and confectionery uh, compared to some of our peers. And um, the KitKat example tees it up perfectly. Um, I think that's the most copied um, uh, example of how people feel value should be created in confectionery, and that is create these global mega brands and then drive it out of the ballpark. And clearly, KitKat is a good example mm -hmm. for that, and you're absolutely right, we only have one. Um, but uh, compared to some of our peers that have several of those, what we also have in that fragmented part, as you call it, of the portfolio, there are some very, very strong local stars. Brands that have tremendous local relevance are seen as part of a local identity and where you may not have the same opportunity to make them global superstars, but clearly locally, there's lots of growth opportunity as you widen the portfolio, offer some varieties and, uh, and basically develop those brands as well. So examples would be Bachi in Italy, you know, a truly iconic brand, Sananus in Chile, which, uh, you know, clearly has an iconic standing there, or Damak in Turkey. So these are high share of mind brands uh, locally that I think we've proven over the years uh, that, you know, in our hands, we've been developing these brands uh, quite successfully. And so, yes, here and there, you will also make adjustments and, and, and pruning where needed. But um, it's important that you're not treating that fragmented part all the same, but rather that you also aren't having a discerning eye for some of the local stars that are in this uh, tale. Another area where, you know, there's been some divestment, um, I mean, in the U.S. waters, the water division, I think, is now around four, less than 4% of your portfolio, yet uh, recognized as a growth uh, category. So I just wanted to understand where we are now on that journey. I know you've been focusing more on premiumization, but it still seems to be quite a small part of the business. So uh, is there any development that can be made there, organically or not? Yeah. So this is another great example of these overlapping cycles that we talked about okay. earlier. So as you know, uh, with our announcements from 2019, 2020, we had uh, focused the water business and, and articulated a strategic transformation plan towards the more premium side of the business and the functional side of the business. And um, we made good on this uh, in part by divesting uh, some of our uh, U.S. Uh, mineral water brands. Uh, we also made good on it partially um, and with one specific transaction, and that is with Essentia in the U.S., which is mm -hmm. um, a good offering and a very successful one in the functional space. But then two things happened. Uh, one is COVID. And COVID, of course, wrecked havoc to out-of-home consumption patterns, and hence, you know, that left a scar on our water's development, just like on any other beverage company that has uh, a strong out-of-home stance. And um, when that was waning and normalizing or starting to normalize, and when we started to see nice growth again, we had another hit, and that is uh, through um, uh, the war and energy yeah. cost and inflation. And water's gets hit particularly hard by that when it comes to profitability because you do have a fairly low weight to value ratio. So relatively speaking, transportation cost is a higher fraction of the total offering. And then also when it comes to the plastic resin for the packaging, of course, that's a major part of the cost structure. So you had first a hit on growth and then you had a hit on profitability. And here also it's important to kind of see through these two overlapping cycles and then see, you know, in a more normalized state going forward. First of all, there were delays then in completing the portfolio transformation we have in mind, so we'll do that over time. And second, uh, this is probably the worst moment in time from a profitability point of view to look at that business right now because uh, simply of these uh, exogenous factors. Um, in terms of disposals, we talk about the U.S. disposal. I think altogether you dispose around 26 billion worth uh, of uh, business for the, since you, 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 you came as a CEO. I, I thought that we were kind of done with that process, but then you talk about the SKU reduction uh, 
Canada frozen food that's going to be uh, folded uh, out. Um, and then the JV with uh, your frozen food Europe. So um, I wanted to know, uh, frozen pizza, excuse me, I wanted to know uh, what else? I mean, do you, are you looking again at the portfolio and is there effectively more uh, that could be uh, looked at from a disposal standpoint? So in fairness, uh, even before we started talking about the SKU rationalization, uh, when we did some of the last um, major divestiture steps, we were always underlining that, you know, portfolio adjustment, there is no beginning into this process. Mm -hmm. So we didn't say it stopped now and now we have the wonderful portfolio for all times. So we did point out that, yes, over time, while some of the heavy lifting had been done in the years uh, 2017 through 2021, there were always going to be uh, portfolio adjustments. Now, for this period, um, I think our CFO put it in very nice terms. What we're really talking about is an ongoing portfolio optimization. And at one end of the spectrum, that may be SKU rationalization. At the other end of the spectrum, it may be partial transactions, like, for example, the, uh, the pizza joint venture here in Europe or the pizza discontinu discontinuation in, in, in Canada. And so... Across that spectrum, yes, uh, you should expect ongoing activity in the name of optimizing the portfolio going forward. And I think that's very much what uh, investors want and see. Mm -hmm. um, if we speak about divestment, we're going to speak as well about M&A. Um, so you did, uh, we, we spoke already some of the few deals that you did in the past. Um, now we have been in a, in a time where uh, multiple had been quite uh, elevated and you've been quite focused on making sure you had the, you strike the right balance in terms of value creation. Um, we are also now seeing that uh, multiples are a bit less, but effectively uh, access to credit may be a bit more complicated uh, for at least your your competitors uh, in, a, in a bit. So how, how should we look at the m and uh, pipeline going forward? Um, I also recall you uh, saying that uh, the sweet spot was the mid-sized deal, and uh, effectively we talk about Bountiful, Starbucks, but there have been no other of those mid-sized deals. So um, is it a lack of available assets? Is it a, an issue about valuation? Um, I think in hindsight, when you look at the overall market valuations through the end of 21, um, I think it was good that we did uh, more divesting at a time when the market was going very strong and that uh, we were quite selective on uh, new acquisitions, including mm -hmm. mid-size acquisitions in that period of time. Uh, the ones we've done, um, I have no regrets over, and I think those strategically are very valuable. But had we gone overboard, uh, we may now uh, live to regret that. So being selective on the acquiring front, I think, uh, was uh, a saving grace in hindsight. Now, um, as I look at the market, you're right, some multiples have moderated, but uh, still value expectations continue to be uh, quite strong. There is individual circumstances where maybe access to financing may be a driving factor. So think about some venture-financed uh, startup companies, but that's not the sweet spot of where we acquire. And so ideally, I would want to wait for things to move a little bit more into range um, mm -hmm. before you ramp up significantly. But let me also underline that you can't always time it like that perfectly. And sometimes you have to strike while the iron is hot and an opportunity presents itself. But having said that, uh, I just wanted to underline, while things may look better than at a perfect moment in time, like the second half of 21, it's not that everyone's uh, value expectations have come significantly down. And hence, it still pays to be cautious and to be selective. Having said that, we are open for business across the full spectrum, as we always pointed out. Mm -hmm. Not that we want to announce anything in a hidden way, but simply to underline that why should we rule out options to grow our business in our core categories? We've always been open towards that. So to me, it's not a news item. It's basically mm -hmm. something that uh, is a mindset and that continues to be to apply. Um, I would like to move to uh, the emerging market. In fact, I will have a question about uh, acquisition potential there. But first, uh, if I think about uh, the emerging market, performance has been <clears throat> quite strong. But how do you see the opportunity and the landscape as some of those emerging markets have themselves emerged or still emerging from COVID in the case of China? 
And then my um, second point there would be about China and India. Um, China, 6% of your sales. India, 2% of your sales. Big business, but relative to Nestle size, um, it's quite small. And I think um, you were talking about, uh, I think you had more ambition to grow China uh, when you came uh, for five years ago. Um, and you know, how can you talk about you know, the potential for evolving the portfolio uh, and you know, is it an issue as well uh, to do uh, m and And shall we think that the pivot now would be more focusing on India, given uh, what seems to be a higher growth prospect for that country? Yeah. So let me try and cover a few of these points. Mm -hmm. And my apologies if this is going to be a somewhat longish answer. But I think all of these are very worthwhile yeah. points. And I understand there's a lot of uh, investor interest uh, mm -hmm. attached to them. So on emerging markets overall, they stand for about 42% of our revenue based on 2022 numbers. And what is important to note is that when you look at the past 10 years, they have been performing above average, not only on total posted organic growth, but also on the underlying real internal growth. And uh, that to me is a very positive indicator. And um, um, I do expect going forward that uh, their performance over a several year time stretch mm -hmm. uh, will continue to be above par. You won't be able in a nervous geopolitical environment to say that for every year, every quarter, but in aggregate over the years, um, I think it, that, that success story will continue to apply. And uh, the composition then, which market specifically is contributing to that may also change over time. But the fact in, in all of them, we have long standing presences and are seen as market insiders and strong local management representation, I think, is a strong plus. Another fact that's often overlooked is that the profitability, so our underlying trading operating profit margin coming from these markets, is also above par. And um, that is a striking difference to many companies that uh, rake it in in their core home markets, but then they dilute their margins as they grow in emerging markets. With us, it's the opposite. So the fact that uh, this part is growing above par is also structurally helping our profitability because we don't see that uh, situation changing over time. So that's just an important high-level um, differentiator here that uh, investors should be aware of. Now, specifically on China, would I love to do more of that? Yes, absolutely. So our sales figure 2022 in total then was about 5.8 billion Swiss francs. Um, and um, we were quite open about the fact that um, over the past few years, uh, until things started to turn around last year, we had not realized our full growth potential. In fact, for reasonably long periods of time, 10, 15 years, I think, while we were growing, we were growing at rates that did not do the full market growth justice. And um, that was also one contributing factor to this reorganization that we announced in the fall of 21 and that we implemented beginning of 22, where we now made it a fully dedicated zone led by a Chinese national, someone who with this team can read that market in much better ways because that market has evolved significantly. And um, guessing uh, from a Western mindset, international mindset, what exactly the Chinese consumer has in mind is uh, not the best way to serve the consumer. So I think we now have a much more China-centric strategy there. Uh, if that can be bolstered with acquisition, I have complete faith in that leadership team that they will pull this off well. And uh, so very supportive there. But going back to what I said earlier, sometimes uh, you do have frothy price expectations in emerging markets. And what I don't want to do is then invest at the top of the market or you know invest at some outsized uh, value expectation. But um, both from an organic point of view, with that new leadership team and the focus, and from a M&A point of view, um, you know, you will see us open for business there. And I think uh, I know there's been a bit of um, concern over the um, the growth in China this spring. This is another one mm -hmm. where individual company circumstance may be quite decoupled from the macro circumstance, because what I see actually is you know improving strength in our Chinese operations and. Uh, and I don't see that changing for the rest of the years. I'm quite optimistic under the circumstances how we will perform in that market. India is about 2 billion Swiss francs in size. And um, here again, after the muggy recall in 2015, 
and uh, you know the one-time setback we had there, you've seen a string of years that were a stellar success organically. Uh, couldn't be happier. Here again, super strong leadership team, very strong local CEO, doing a fantastic job. And um, uh, but it is true that our presence there is quite selective. Uh, so we don't have the same broad-based category presence that we have in other core markets. And yes, ideally, I'd like to have uh, a stronger footprint there. But then again, at times of very strong market growth expectations, you sometimes also mm -hmm. find over-the-top valuation expectations. And that game we're not playing. So we will stay selective there and, uh, and not lose our common sense. Um, talking about uh, capital allocation, um, so you are now into a 20 billion share buyback that will end in 2024. Uh, in the absence of M&A, should we expect that a share buyback will be continuing um, as long as you are in the right target range on your balance, on your leverage? And then my uh, my other question on that point was uh, about L'Oréal. So you own 20%, which allows you to consolidate a percentage of the profit of L'Oréal. Does it mean that uh, it's a level which you will not go below because otherwise it will be quite dilutive from an earnings standpoint? So is it a bit of a, a no, no change at this level? Yeah. So let me try to be as helpful as I yep. can, but also I hope no one is disappointed if what I can say is uh, limited. So on the share buybacks, we're still in the first half of what is a three-year share buyback period that began at the beginning of 22 and goes through the end of 24. And so speculating now on what exactly the situation is going to be like at the end of 24 and what that means for buyback activity going forward after that uh, in my opinion, is a little bit early. I think um, we've always very dutifully implemented these um, several-year programs um, in line with the announcement. And when you read at something that we put very consistently into those announcements, you also see where the preference is. We, I mean, on each and every one of them, starting with June 2017, uh, we were saying that um, uh, should... Uh, a significant opportunity come along, we reserve the right uh, to adjust the volume of these uh, buybacks. And uh, that shows you that as a company that lives and breathes by building it, its business, we do place a premium on, uh, in fact, growing our core business over just buying back shares. And I think that should not surprise anyone. In fact, it should be seen as a positive side because we have faith in what this category, that uh, or the categories we operate in, what they have to offer going forward. And so that has not changed. And so um, that's why, you know, um, all things being equal, there's always going to be, under the right circumstances, a preference for acquiring over uh, just doing buybacks. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to L'Oreal, again, also not in a position to comment. Um, I think everyone can look up what the accounting and consolidation rules are. But um, I think what we've proven there over the years is that we have been First of all, that we see this as a large financial stake. Uh, we want to avoid any misunderstandings here that came from the mm -hmm. word strategic in the past, and that we've been acting as very good stewards of Nestle shareholders owning this very valuable asset with a superbly run company, but then, you know, basically administering it, uh, that stake, uh, with value for Nestle shareholders in mind. Um, as we almost near the end of this uh, discussion, I wanted to go back to uh, uh, the PNL gross margin recovery, um, which you alluded uh, early on when we were talking about inflation. So you're still at a stage where you need to recover that. And if I look versus 2020, gross margin are off about 400 basis points below that level. So any reason why structurally you could not get there? Uh, but then if I look at your EBIT margin uh, guidance of a uh, target, 17.5 to 18.5 by 2025, um, at the midpoint, uh, that would uh, imply 100 basis point of margin improvement. So 300 basis point of reinvestment would be the guide the implied guide. So can you talk about those reinvestment? Uh, or can we as well uh, think that there's some form of conservatism in how you've guided on the margin performance? Yeah, very important question. And let me start with the gross margin yeah. and underline my full confidence that we can repair that over time. 
but also remind investors about one thing that we said from the beginning when we saw that the cross margin was sliding under uh, the inflation impact, and that is we were saying that repairing it over time would take longer than the time it took to, to, to get it down. So we should not, you should not model it in ways where it took about 18 to 24 months to bring it down to where it is, uh, that exactly in that time period uh, you repair it going forward. That repairing has to be more nuanced the longer we go into it. And you see this reflected in the current pricing discussions where there's more pushback, understandably, and where you have to limit yourself selectively to those situations where there truly is some repairing to do. You can't now so much operate with vast across the board uh, price increases anymore. And um, so that's why we have to become a lot more surgical and targeted and uh, be sure that uh, retailers, consumers, the public understand our moves. Is it doable? Yes, it's absolutely doable. I think the brand's strength and our innovation capabilities will help us uh, make that happen. Now, having said that, uh, the easy math, if you repair all of that, aren't you going to be overshooting your underlying trading operating profit margin? That overlooks a few other items that we also uh, want to okay. pay for going forward. Um, so yes, there is the fraction which is the underlying trading operating profit recovery because we're below our target range now. So first of all, we have to get back to that target range. Second, uh, we also indicated and underlined that we want to spend more on um, marketing spend going forward. So here, uh, and also innovation pipeline spend. I mean, th the whole growth aspect of the business going forward is one that we don't want to lose sight of. And so that'll take extra spending. And then we also made it clear that um, the uh, sustainability side of the house uh, is only going to be increasing year after year. And especially when you look at the large flagship uh, commitments around greenhouse gas emission reduction and uh, plastic waste, just to name a few, and it's not an exclusive mm -hmm. list and, and an exhaustive list, there's going to be more, but um, uh, just those alone are very important and uh, very expensive undertakings. I do think we're well advised to actually stay on track and deliver those commitments and, uh, and, 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 and be online, but uh, those over the years, as some of the low-hanging fruit is uh, taken, I think also will progressively become more expensive. So if you put all of that together, uh, for a company now on a several year time span to say, look, uh, we're getting back up to this range uh, is also something that in my view, in all modesty, compares quite favorably to what you hear from other industry players. And hence, it's important to stay realistic as to how much that can be and not now try to model in something that's over and above the range. Mm -hmm. I think whether you look at the end of last year or whether you look at this guidance or other type of uh, types of expectations that we articulate, um, staying with where we are as opposed to going north, uh, I think usually does get rewarded. And maybe just to conclude on that, uh, because we were talking about the defensive level defensiveness of Nestle at the beginning, you articulated the target of 6 to 10 percent EPS growth at the end of last year, uh, which I think was meant to give um, visibility uh, to investors as we look over the next two, three years. So um, that confidence in growing that 6 to 10 percent EPS, um, is that coming from, uh, you think, the visibility you have on rebuilding that margin? Um, and how do you expect the four to six, uh, what is your confidence on the four to six percent in an environment that, as we discussed, could still be a bit choppy uh, in the next couple of years? Yeah. So the EPS was meant as a helpful additional piece of math. Um, it's not a switch in the way we guide uh, because our core guidance items continue to be organic growth and the underlying trading operating profit margin. But I do understand that below the line, uh, we are still a very large and sometimes hard to understand company where people could easily uh, misjudge uh, currency swings with not below the line but impacting all factors um, in the PL, but then tax rates, um, share buyback actions, and so forth. And I wanted to be sure that um, people have a good understanding what our expectations through the year 25 translate into when it comes to uh, the underlying EPS. That was the idea behind it. It's not that all of a sudden underlying EPS is taken over when it comes to, uh, to the guidance. Um, 
it compares quite well with what we've done over the last few years. So it's not something that's out of the ballpark. So it shouldn't surprise people that we are kind of pointing to that range. And uh, so we have a confidence level that we can make that happen is there. On the four to six organic growth, um, uh, yes, that is, and that continues to be our longer term uh, organic growth ambition and, 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 and expectation for the year 25. Again, could you see, depending on what circumstances happen geopolitically or quarter after quarter, generations that take you above or below? Yes, you can, like we're above now. Yeah. But um, does it over time compute to something in that range? Uh, yes, I have a lot of confidence in that. Mark, uh, thank you so much for the discussion, for your time and sharing your thoughts. Um, it was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Um, good afternoon. <laughs>